Well, good morning, everyone. It's great to be back. It's been a while since I've been here, and so thank you for all the warm, smiling faces, and uh, I appreciate it, and uh, it's wonderful. We're in a series, Kenny has been leading uh, the church in a series on what we believe, and in this series, we're taking a look at the core truths, the core realities of what anchor this community as we move out and do life uh, together. And so today, I want to talk about the Holy Spirit. And we've done a series on the Holy Spirit. In fact, I even gave a message during that time, during that season. And so there's a couple foundational truths that I want to maybe remind us on. And then I want to maybe share a little bit observations, maybe pull back the curtain a little bit on just how, how is it that the Holy Spirit works? So it's not a mental uh, cognition type lesson on what we believe and a set of propositions, but truly how is it the Spirit stirs, moves on a very practical level? And so I just want to state maybe one disclaimer just really, really quick. You might hear me refer to the Holy Spirit as her. God is spirit. Uh, Jesus had a gender, which was male. The Holy Spirit is referred as spirit in the text. It's also referred in all the pronouns in, in the feminine. So there is no male pronoun in Scripture referring to the Holy Spirit. So I'm not doing that as a way um, to make a statement. I just, out of, um, out of just times, that that's how I speak at times. So I'll refer to the Holy Spirit as spirit. Sometimes you might hear me refer to the Holy Spirit as her. Now, having said that, let me lay out a couple quick foundations as we get into this series with the Holy Spirit. And the first is this, that the Holy Spirit is really not some supplemental figure in our lives. I think too often, and I've been this person, where I, working as a youth pastor for a long time, we talked about the Holy Spirit and it was always in the categories of the role of the Holy Spirit. This is the role of the Holy Spirit. This is the works of the Holy Spirit. As if the Holy Spirit is this distanced figure or this figure that just comes and drops things in our lap to kind of make things happen. We have all the salvation we need from Jesus and what he did on the cross. And, and the Holy Spirit is a helper. And it's not enmeshed with the reality of the Holy Spirit as this living, moving force in our lives. So it's not just a supplemental figure. Secondly... And laying out just two foundational uh, truths here is this. You cannot transform yourself. You cannot get yourself to be the disciple of who Jesus is on your own, in your own strength, in your own fortitude. That is just impossible. That the Spirit of God is the one that will bring about the transformation in your life. So those are the two foundational truths that I just want to lay out there and to have that in the back of our minds that's running as we move through um, the sermon uh, this morning. So, but how? How is it that the Holy Spirit moves and works in our life? That's what I want to get at a little bit this morning and to take again a peek at that. So when I was in middle school, when I entered sixth grade, I had to take physical education as an actual class. 
And as I was taking physical education, my brother was reminding me the night before, first day of sixth grade, I, I, not, I, he wasn't reminding me. I asked him, I said, Charlie, you're a year older than me. What's it like? You know, what, what do I need to be prepared for for PE? As a very awkward kid that struggled in motor skills, not just fine motor skills, but maybe basic motor skills. And uh, he's like, well, Lloyd, you know, they'll do some warm-ups and then do some jumping jacks, and then you'll go, you'll go run. I said, okay, jumping jacks. Now, I, I've seen a jumping jack. I've observed jumping jacks. I know what a jumping jack is, but I could not get my brain to get my brain in sync with my body to do a jumping jack. So I said, Charlie, I'm so glad I asked you. you got to help me. How do I do a jumping jack? And he goes, Lloyd, it's, it's interesting. It, it, it goes in two phases. I said, okay, okay, I'm ready. He says, what you do is you start by bending your knees and flapping your arms, and then it'll morph into a jumping jack. <laughs> So I said, dude, I can bend my knees and flap my arms. This is a true story. I just, this is awful. And so, so I, off to school I go. And uh, so there we are. We're in line and um, in PE. And then the, the teacher yells out, okay, give me 10 jumping jacks when I stay. Go. We're going to start with one. And as soon as he said that, I thought, okay, it's going to kind of morph. I better get going right now. So I started, you know, bounce, you know, bending my knees and flapping my arms. And then all of a sudden he's like, one, two. And people are like doing normal jumping jacks. I'm not going to do one here. Um, so, and, and then so, you know, I'm doing this, but it's not morphing yet. And then the coach yells out, Gilbert, that's not a jumping jack. I'm like, okay, okay, when's it going to be a jumping jack? And he walks up to me, he's looking at me, and you know, it was an absolute disaster. The only thing that saved me from just social destruction that day was the students, uh, my classmates, thought I was actually mocking uh, the coach, and so, which actually kind of saved me. And, and so he's looking at me, he's shaking his head, and I kind of whispered, I'm like, I don't know how to do a jumping jack, and how do I get my head in sync with my body? How do I get my head wrapped around how this process works? As we think about the Holy Spirit, that we know the role of the Holy Spirit, we know, as Kenny says, that, again, the Holy Spirit is not some supplemental figure like the Amazon truck that comes and drops off a package and, here's spiritual gifts, you got them now, you know? Like, but how, how do I start to live and move in my being in light of the Holy Spirit, being in sync with the Holy Spirit? And so as, as we start this this, this talk this morning, I want to look at some movements of people, in particular with Paul and with Peter, and really look at some practical, concrete ways of how the Spirit really does work, that I can not just know it in my mind, um, but that I can um, um, actually know it in my full embodied self. And, and yet, at times, it is still a mystery. Um, as, as, she, as Jesus used the analogy of the Spirit's work and said, you know, the Spirit, like the wind, it blows where it goes. And a lot of times the Spirit does lead us into really ways that maybe we would not have seen or understood before. So that's the direction I want to go, and with that, let's pray, and let's dive into God's Word this morning. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you um, so much for this time as we, again, look at your Word 
to understand the Spirit's role in our life as you are wanting to move and, and stir in us. And Lord, there's some real concrete ways that your Spirit does work. And we want to sync up to that. So God, peel back the truths in your scripture as we come to understand these things. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So as we dive in, I want to take us to Romans chapter 8. I want to look at verses 9 and 10. And this is a foundational passage. Just like in my opening comments, there were some of these foundational truths I was laying out. I want to lay down a foundational truth that will kind of situate us, but there's some practicality here as well that I want to unpack. And so Romans 8 is a phenomenal passage. Many have said if you can pick one chapter of the Bible to just give people that will just explain the Christian life, it's Romans 8. Romans 8 works against the doom of Romans 7 that we all experience at times where Paul was describing his life and how he wants to do what is right but finds himself in this place often of resignation, of acquiescing and, and giving in to sin. And Romans 8 opens up this new understanding, this new possibility and hope, and it's life in the Spirit, how the Holy Spirit works in us. It's too dense for us to unpack everything. There's so much to be said here about how the Holy Spirit works in our lives, but I just want to briefly um, highlight verses 9 and 10. Romans 8, 9 and 10. And it says this, but you are not in the flesh. You are in the Spirit. Since the Spirit of God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, Though the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. And so in Romans 8, 9, and 10, we are in this new reality. We are in this new sphere of living because the spirit is a life-giving presence. The Spirit of God is moving in through us. The Spirit of God is, is this active, living presence. Notice the word that Paul uses, that the Spirit of God dwells in you. This is taking up residence. This is the picture of a home, a house. The Spirit of God has made her home inside of you, inside of your heart, is now moving through you. It's a powerful, beautiful picture. Again, so often I think when I was growing up, it was the Spirit of God was like a jack-in-the-box um, that you, you uh, wind the crank and it pops out, right? So I'll be reading Scripture, and the Spirit pops up and enlightens me, and thank you, Holy Spirit, for, for helping me understand this verse and knowing how to apply it in my life. Or I'm stuck in a decision of what to do, and all of a sudden the Spirit pops up and says, okay, you, you have to forgive that person. Or um, I want you to go and do X, Y, Z. Again, a Spirit of God in this way was relegated to just simply a role, or this is the purpose. But here Paul is saying, no, this is a new reality. The Spirit of God is this energizing, active, living. The, the Spirit of Christ, the, Spirit of the Holy Spirit who raised Jesus Christ from the dead now dwells in you. You know, um, it was uh, um, 
I'm drawing the name on the blood, trying to blink on his name. Dallas Willard, thank you. It was Dallas Willard. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Uh, so. <laughs> that was too easy. That, that was terrible. I should just sit, sit down. All right. So is the Holy Spirit, so Dallas Willard says, the Holy Spirit is always initiating. Always. So the Holy Spirit, it is living and walking in our being every moment of each day. So if this is the reality, then how can I be attuned to the Spirit's initiatives within my life? And that Dallas Willard says, and I don't wait for the Holy Spirit to make an initiation. The Holy Spirit is initiating every moment. And he says, now the ball is in your court. So there's efforts. We're not just this passive person. No, the Holy Spirit is moving in me, always initiating. How can I be still and be quiet and to be attuned, attentive to those Spirit's initiatives? Then I sync up my actions, as Dallas Willard says in one of those foundational core truths that we talked about previously, that, that as Dallas Willard says, the Holy Spirit and God is not opposed to effort. It's opposed to um, merit. And I would even go on to say, and opposed to expectations and results. So, so this was just a foundational passage again. And I love also Paul's words in 1 Corinthians 15, 10. Um, sorry, I forgot to cycle through the verse there. Um, again, there's that verse with the Christ who dwells in you. Here's 1 Corinthians 15, 10. It says, by the grace of God, I am what I am. Again, the reality, that transformation, the responsibility of transformation is the Spirit's. Now, it is my role and my responsibility to submit to the Spirit's movements in my life. But the transformation, those results of transformation is the Spirit's work. I am what I am by His grace toward me. On the contrary, I worked harder. So again, Paul is saying there is this effort. Though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. And the word with is a really powerful term, even in the original Greek language. The word with always is, is set in the context of personal relationship. It's a personal word. So with me, it's this participation. It's a participatory relationship. So it's God's grace and it's the Holy Spirit that is the channel of God's grace through me, and I'm participating if with my efforts in that grace. But thank you, Jesus, and thank you, Holy Spirit, that you're flowing through me. And I don't have to do something to clean myself up to suddenly activate it. Or I don't sit and wonder when it's going to pop up next. It's flowing through my body. Let me take you to another passage out of Romans 5.5. 5. And this is a really practical passage that I think gives us a picture a little bit more of how. So Romans 5.5. 5. Romans 5.5 5 says this, and hope does not disappoint us because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that he has given us. There's volumes that has been written on the connection of our affect, our emotions, and our will, and how all of that plays out within God's work in our life. But here's just a small practical picture of how this works, that God pours into us his love through the work of the Holy Spirit. And so how does that outpouring occurs in me that 
my emotions and my will, which again is a body experience, does begin to be changed. Newer affections, new desires. So there is a infusion that takes place by God in the way that he does begin to change and reorient my life. Let me give you a practical picture of this from uh, my week. Um, as many of you know, I work at a retreat center. I got a chance to meet with a pastor who came away on retreat. I was sitting with him the other day, and um, in meeting with him, I just asked, I said, where is it that the God has been working in you? Where, what is the Spirit? This is exactly the question I asked. Um, what is the Spirit raising to the surface in you? And he said, Lloyd, I just sat in a place of being loved this week. And he was telling me about all these situations back at church that he's trying to control. And he was sharing with me all these insecurities that he has. And he was talking about that he was using control to try and secure God's love for him. And as I was, and, and so here he is on this retreat, and he was wound up in the beginning, and he had this sensation that, okay, I, I got a lot of fixing here, and Holy Spirit, you probably want to do a lot of fixing in me. And then he looks at me, he goes, I realized in this moment that the Holy Spirit just wanted to love me. That was it. And not to fix. God wasn't angst, filled with angst to fix him on this retreat, but just to love him. And he said, Lloyd, as I sat and I just felt a wave of God's love come over me in such a way that that love pushed this repentance out of me and this confession of control out of me. And I just sat, I just sat knowing I'm just loved. And there's nothing else I need to do to gain more love. Romans 5.5, 5, the spirit through Christ who pours his love in us and through us. And the way that he was able to make those connections, again, was quieting his heart and to sit in those spaces let me, so here's Paul, and this is Paul's experience as well. And there were times where Paul had absolute wild experiences with the Spirit, where he was on the road to Damascus with this conversion experience, where it was out of left field, here's the Holy Spirit grabbing him. And there's other times where the Spirit of God is a very slow work of an outpour of love. As Kenny mentioned earlier in his comments, I, I think, too, in this wild times that we're in of, um, man, the Spirit of God does not want to move me in fear, but in love, and to continue to love those all around me. Let me go into Peter and look at some of the movements that Peter had in his life, because Peter is great, and I love Peter as an example because with him and a lot of his impulses and his behaviors and to see him experience transformation at the end, again, we have these observations, we see it, but how? How did Peter get to these transformations that he got to? Again, I want to look at a foundational passage, and then I want to bring us into a very concrete picture. So here's a foundational passage. God the Father, and this is coming out of 1 Peter 1, 2. God the Father knew you, chose you long ago, and his spirit made you holy. His spirit makes you holy. As a result, you have obeyed him and have been cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. May God give you more and more grace and peace. Again, as we take a look at this passage, and I love the connections here, it is putting efforts and work 
in the right order. So the Spirit is making you holy. The Spirit is doing a transforming work. As a result, I am now sinking my efforts where the Holy Spirit is beginning to change me. Sometimes I want to look at my life and I realize, God, I'm trying to bring about a transformation that maybe you're putting on hold right now. Maybe you're wanting to transform this part of me first and then move on to that. That I can't absorb all of it at once. It, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be too overwhelmed. So again, where, Spirit, are you doing your work? How can I sync up my, my efforts to that? As a result, God, of your work, now I'm ready to obey. I'm looking for your initiation first, and then I'll sync up. Foundational text. Again, so now what I want to do is I want to look at an actual scene from Peter's life where we see the Holy Spirit impressing upon his emotions and his senses and his body, the Spirit actually moving in him. And this takes place prior to even um, the death of Jesus on the cross. So with that, Turn with me in your Bible um, to Luke chapter 22, and I'll pull it up here. So Luke chapter 22, and this is coming out of verse 54. So Luke 22, 54, Jesus is in his final week. He's going to be arrested and be betrayed by Judas. Jesus has announced that Peter is going to deny Christ three times. And so this is the scene of Peter's denial. So Luke chapter 22, verse 54. Luke twenty two fifty four. Then they seized him and led him away, bringing him into the high priest's house. But Peter was following at a distance. So I want to make a note here, again, of the scene. Jesus is being arrested He's being led away. Jesus is led into the home of the high priest. He's going to face like a, what, maybe a little mini trial. He's going to be questioned inside the home. Jesus is sitting with a different group of people inside a house being questioned. Peter is outside of the house. Peter is in a courtyard There's lots of distance, and it's nighttime. I paint that picture for a reason as we continue to move through the Gospel of Luke. So with that, let's look at verse 55. When they had kindled the fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat among them. Verse 56, then a servant girl, um, seeing him in the firelight, stared at him and said, this man also was with him. But Peter denied it, saying, woman, I do not know him. That was him beginning all of these denials that Christ had said. And as we look at verses 58 through 60, we're going to see that Peter goes on to deny two more times, right? So in verse 60, but Peter says, man, I do not know what you're talking about. At that moment, while he was still speaking, the cock crowed. Okay, So Peter denies Christ just as Christ had said. Luke, unlike Mark, Matthew, or John in telling the story, Luke includes a very, very fascinating detail. Again, Jesus is inside the house. It's nighttime. Peter's out in the courtyard. It's speculation to say, how Jesus looked at him. Notice with me in verse 61. The Lord turned and looked at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he said to him, before the cock crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went out and he wept bitterly. So some people say, oh yeah, Jesus had this pastoral look. Um, maybe Jesus went to the window, kind of looked through the courtyard and kind of saw him, speculative, maybe. Um, Simeon Zal, who is this other theologian, says, what if the look was a look on the inside? 
which is kind of where I lined up, and that's speculative as well. But notice what he says here in his comments. The Lord turned and looked at Peter. Um, oh, wait. Uh, the Lord looked upon him. He says, Simeon says this, this place, this took place interiorly. It took place in his mind. It took place in his will. By his mercy, the Lord, in a hidden manner, helped him, touched his heart, awakened his memory, visited the interior human being with his grace, and stirred up and produced an affection in the interior human being, even to the point of exterior tears. See how God is present to help our wills and our actions. I love this beautiful picture. Yes, P Jesus looked at him. Luke includes a really fascinating detail. And if this was a look on the interior, here we see the movements of the Holy Spirit upon him. Peter remembered what Jesus had said. So here we see the Spirit of God in, uh, awakening the memory. And then we see the Spirit of God now moving in his body to the point of these exterior tears. This is a very concrete, practical way that God embodies us and moves in us. This is a beautiful, incredible, incredible picture. And, and Simeon all goes on to say, look, it is very mysterious. Yeah, the Holy Spirit pushes on the levers of our emotions and our wills, and at times it's really kind of hard to understand. But like Peter, maybe we can get to a moment where we are still and quiet, and then we can see, oh, wow, God, the other day when I felt this, maybe that was your spirit working on my heart. God, when I quieted myself down, I was able to hear your voice through your spirit. We sung that song this morning, and it included the lines. I wrote it down because it was so great. Oh, good shepherd, oh, good friend, slow me down. So the other day, um, I, I was in a really wound up state. Uh, there were some things happening in our family, and, and I was just super anxious. And I just had this prompt, go and sit. So I just went and I sat and in this moment, just like the person that was there on retreat, just experience the love of God. Experience the love of God loving me, even in my ways I don't maybe love the way I should. And it was in the stillness that created a movement that made me now say, oh, this is what I need to do. As I was still, I was able to connect the dots to the Spirit's work in my life. But the Spirit of God is not also just relegated to simply the interior life. I think often we have that picture in our world. But to now notice, too, where is the Spirit of God maybe moving me into my community? Not just personal character transformation, but to those around me. And with that, I want to go to a, a text we're all very, very familiar with. Turn with me to Luke chapter 4, because the Spirit of God is at work and that is moving amongst those that are in poverty, that are oppressed people groups. Luke chapter 4, let's look at the verse here in verse 18 and 19. I love it. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. And this is Christ who is speaking. He's quoting the prophet Isaiah because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery to the blind to let the oppressed go free. And so Jesus is even now being led as Jesus is starting his ministry and we're going to see this unfolding ministry where the Spirit of God is leading Jesus into 
these people groups that are oppressed. Again, because the Spirit votes for life. The Spirit of God is a living presence. And the Spirit of God wants to invade places where life is being robbed and that people are in those places wondering and are feeling hopeless. And the Spirit wants to bring this infusion of hope that there is a Savior of the world, Jesus Christ, who wants to come and redeem you, redeem you both of your sin and redeem you of your plight. And how do we align ourselves to those movements? And so we, um, and so it, there was a, um, a theologian, her name is Gloria Schaub, and uh, she says this, um, when she was talking about the Spirit of God on this magnitude level, she says, the forces and energies that God places within the people by enlightenment, charism, solidarity, enthusiasm, can be interpreted as actions and impulses of the work of the Holy Spirit as Jesus himself experienced. It's really profound. And I think back to years and years ago, um, there were a group of covenant pastors that were going to go down, um, it was in March, and they were going to be, um, they were going to go and join these protests um, and join in a walk in downtown L.A. Uh, on, in regards to immigration. And uh, I just want to make a quick comment. They weren't in sync with immigration policy of the day. They were in sync with the Holy Spirit and the hearts and the lives of people and wanting to go and be with God's people and to just understand their plight more. And they invited me, and I really wanted to go, and I wasn't able to go. My kids were really little, and they got sick. I wasn't able to go and join the immigration march. I was really kind of bummed. But my, my heart was awakened. My, my senses were more acutely aware. And so that, that particular week, I had gone to youth group, and there was a girl in our ministry, and she was from Honduras, and the Spirit just moved me. Lloyd, um, you couldn't join this march, but sit with her and her story. And so I had gone up to her, and I looked at her and said, and will you just, I just want to know your story. And she started to, to have these tears, and she said, Lloyd, I, I have no home. My mom and dad, they immigrated from Honduras to here. I've been ridiculed at school. Nobody accepts me. Nobody extends any invites to me. I, I don't speak the language. She spoke very, very broken English. And then this summer, we went back to Honduras, and they called me white girl, and I had no home there. This is not life, right? This is not her experiencing this energizing life. And so I had her come and share her story to the rest of the youth group. The youth group was so moved that even her small group embraced her and they just welcomed her at a deeper, deeper level where she was stepping into a richness of life. This is joining in the spirits, in the spirit of God as he's moving us into these spaces. So we're in this series, what do we believe? <laughs> and you know, we believe and Jesus Christ crucified and resurrected. And we believe that the Holy Spirit that raised Jesus lives in us to draw us further into the heart of Jesus, to bring about a character transformation, and to bring us into this bigger, wider picture of what the Spirit is doing. And a very real, moment by moment, full embodied experience. I don't have to wait around for it. The Spirit of God is working in me right now. Well, I hope that this week you'll have some time to sit in some reflection with these verses and to contemplate how the Spirit might be moving you, might be moving you to go and to sit with the stories of those at the church in Watts. I love this church. I love Kenny and Brittany's leadership and the way they pastor 
and trying to lead you into these spaces of where the Spirit is at work. Amen? Amen. Thank you so much. God bless you. Let me pray. Father, we thank you for how, you, again, you are stirring and moving in us in ways that is a bit mysterious and yet very real. Lord, we are um, just humbled, so deeply humbled of your son and the sacrifice made to bring us new life, but not a one and done, not um, some event that has no lasting impact, but your spirit that was on him that is now in us, actively moving and changing and pressing, reorienting, regenerating. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.